This is Ag Matters PM from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network, brought to you by the Iowa Soybean Association. Your daily recap of the information that affects Iowa's farmers, producers, and consumers, right here in the heart of the heartland. With reports from our award-winning broadcast team of Dustin Hoffman, Riley Smith, and Mark Magnuson. Now, from the IARN studios in Des Moines, here's Dustin Hoffman. Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to Ag Matters PM from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. I'm Dustin Huffman. Today is Wednesday, August the 21st, 2024. We're so glad you could join us. Coming up a little later on in the program, I had the chance during the Iowa State Fair to get a legislative update with Iowa 3rd District Congressman Zach Nunn. But first, let's go ahead and run down those closing markets. It's time now for the Ag Matters PM Closing Market Summary, your source for market analysis and settlement prices from the day's trade in Chicago, courtesy of the folks at agmarket.net. Well, we're at the end of the trading day, and it's time to talk with Kenan Layden of agmarket.net. Kenan, what did we see come out of that grain market today? Wheat was the downside leader today with a lot of pressure on prices. Um, corn finished the day mixed some of those front months up slightly while the back months were down. And soybeans um, were able to small, post small gains today. So what is it that put pressure on that wheat market today? Um, things I've seen um, that, that Paris trade in wheat was substantially lower today and also there's that looming Canadian rail strike um, that might go into effect this week that will shut down you know a lot of the railways coming in and out of North America from northern U.S. into Canada and that will be a logistical nightmare for a lot of this northern wheat that gets growing and moves into Canada into the Pacific Northwest and just kind of shut down some of those trains. So what was it then that uh made the corn and soybean markets uh, end up closing the way they did today? You know, some, some of that news today is that they might be gaining support just due to being competitively priced worldwide and seeing some actual export business, which led some support to those crops. Um, we saw the flash sales yesterday. And so that is good news, competitive on a world scale. And so hopefully, you know, we can get a floor in here, not that, you know, fundamentals will still weigh heavily on this market, especially as you move into harvest. But seeing that export come in is positive for the market. All right. And then switching over to the livestock side of things, I know cattle took it on the chin yesterday pretty hard. It looked mixed the last time I had seen it, but where did we end up? We'll start with the cattle market. How did we end up there? Yeah. So like you said, to eat. It's still mixed. Last time I looked at it also, you know, feeders were able to recover, which was good to see. You know, that September contract was pushing towards its December 2023 lows, which is kind of a worrying sign, but it was able to recover, you know, a buck today. Um, live cattle were down today and the hogs were mixed across the board. And what kind of momentum did we see in the hogs to cause that mixture? What, what was kind of the story there? You know, the things I've read on the hogs is, you know, macroeconomic factors may be weighing on this, you know, cattle and hog market. If, if there's decreased demand for high priced beef, that could be supportive for pork prices, which is a cheaper source of protein. Um, but also with hogs, you know, there's some higher weights um, for slaughter, which might pose some resistance here as the hog market moves up. All right. Well, a lot of stuff for us to be thinking about. If folks want to, you know, talk with the, with all of you at agmarket.net, maybe get some ideas of what they should be thinking about, both with marketing and, and trading these uh, futures, what's the best way for them to get in touch? Yeah. Uh, just go online, agmarket.net, look for a broker in your area, sign up for some market information and see if it's something that fits your operation. All right. Well, we thank you so much, Kenan, for that information and look forward to talking to you again real soon. Thank you, Dustin. That again was Kenan Layden of agmarket.net. Let's look at the closing numbers now on the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network market screen. 
At the close, September corn was up a half at 375 and a half. Soybeans were up five and three quarters at 963 even. Soy meal up 20 cents at 312.50. Soy oil was trading 29 cents higher at $41 even. Chicago wheat down 13 and a quarter at 519 and three quarters. Kansas wheat down nine and three quarters at 536 and a quarter. Minneapolis spring wheat down nine cents at 581 and a quarter. Oats down three and a half at 327 even. On the Merck Live, cattle down 97 cents at 174.62. Feeders up a buck 17 at 235.67. Lean hogs down 25 cents at 76.15. Pork cutouts unchanged at 90.92. Class three milk up eight cents at 22.58. And that's been a check of your closing market numbers. We'll go ahead and take a quick break and hear from our sponsor, the Iowa Soybean Association and the Soy Checkoff. When we come back, Iowa Third District Congressman Zach Nunn. This is Ag Matters PM. Iowa Soybean Association is driven to deliver for Iowa's 40,000 soybean farmers. We're proud to provide objective agronomic research, a helping hand with soil and water stewardship, and timely industry news powered by the Soybean Checkoff. Learn more at IASoybeans.com. Welcome back to AMPM from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. I'm Dustin Huffman. Well, we had a chance during the Iowa State Fair to talk with many folks, including Iowa politicians, about what's going on in Washington, D.C. Of course, the Farm Bill was the hot topic but there were other legislative issues that needed to be addressed. With Congress on the August recess and then the campaign season coming up in September, things are going to be very difficult, especially trying to get a farm bill across the finish line. Iowa 3rd District Congressman Zach Nunn gives us an update on where things are in Washington. Lots of things, obviously, to talk about top of mind. You know, obviously, you got the August recess going on right now. Right. A lot of farmers are talking about what didn't get done more than what did get yeah. done this year. And, of course, farm bill is top of mind. We just had the NCBA president joining us a few minutes ago. He was talking about that as well. I mean, you, we've talked about why it needs to be done, how soon it needs to be done. We, what's the story yeah. where we're at? Well, candidly, I wanted it to be done last fall when it was supposed to be done. I'm mm -hmm. 18 months on this job, and one of the things that we made a priority being on the Ag Committee and just being from Iowa is making sure that we have top priorities in there. That's why I'm glad Iowa outkicked its coverage. I got to lead 17 bills that were included in the Farm Bill. The bipartisan version of the House bill got through all the way back in May. So we've been able to show both sides can work on this. We can support SNAP, but we can also do things that I think are really important for Iowa. Protect our commodity prices, our insurance. Uh, we moved a large bill forward to help young and beginning farmers get the access they need to credit. Um, I led specifically a bill uh, called Goldie's Act to help shut down you know, bad uh, puppy mills that are hurting animals and work with our local law enforcement. We also have more uh, responsibility in there for USDA to do its job and actually talk to Iowans, find out what they need and make sure those things are processed. A big aspect of this is getting hard dollar infrastructures invested, whether that's for rural farm to market roads or um, high speed broadband for rural communities. You know this, as we go out farming, you talk with farmers now, precision ag is gonna be where it's at. Uh, the role of artificial intelligence in this all needs to be brought in. I've championed Iowa State University as a huge part. So. We've gotten our job done in the House. Now I'm asking the Senate, do its job, either look at our bill, which I think is pretty darn good and has bipartisan support, or at least put something down on paper that we can have a conversation about. Right now, challengingly, uh, the Senate has continued to do no action on this, and um, I'm cautiously optimistic we'll move forward for what's going to happen during the lame duck session. Maybe some of these senators end up losing their job and actually have a conversation with us about moving a farm bill forward. You know, and we were, when I was out in D.C. in April was the yeah. day Senator Stabenow released her version of what she wanted the farm bill to look like. Now, obviously, we know that there's historically differences between right. the House and Senate That's version. Right. But what is it about, usually, we used to always be, we always knew that it was going to come together. Yeah. The four corners would come together, they would sit down, they'd hash it out, and then they'd have something to go. Where has that gotten lost? Yeah, it's gotten lost first and foremost, and we need an actual farm in this year's farm bill. And I am concerned that this is a once in a five year opportunity, not only to support the things what Senator Sabinow wants, I think she wants SNAP, but she wants SNAP plus. I mean, right now, SNAP takes up about 80% of the overall farm bill. We're talking about a $1.5 trillion farm bill. So a lot of money going to support SNAP, which is absolutely important, but it shouldn't be at a point where that's all we're gonna talk about. There are family farmers across the country that need the support right now. We've got 87,000 of those family farmers right here. And that's where I think the House has held the line, been able to bring bipartisan support and say, let's actually get a farm bill that helps, you know, the producer, the grower, the manufacturer, the consumer, and ultimately the family here. Um, I've got six kids and it is expensive to feed them right now. It's something that obviously we're going to do, but when Iowa, the number one producer of eggs, sees egg prices go up 40% over the past three years, we've got a real problem in the ag market. 
I looked at the price per bushel for corn right now, we're down to just under $4. That is not sustainable for a family farm. So being able to move forward something that really supports our growers, our producers, is gonna be essential in any farm bill. I want the Senate to take that to heart, to recognize the importance of it. The House is there, and um, this is why I say, if Senator Stabenow no longer is chairwoman after November, she may think about her legacy of saying, I wanna help family farms and families across the country and come back to the negotiating table. And when we talk about the fact that it costs so much to feed a family, right. obviously we need those programs, like you said, of SNAP yep. and these things. How do we find that balance between helping these people in a time when the cost of eating and feeding your family is going higher, but also the same token, making sure we're fiscally responsible yeah. for making sure that this isn't a burden on the taxpayers beyond what obviously what we need. That's absolutely right. So this is why we do a, fi a farm bill for once in every five years. So we can have some strategy in this long-term plan and not just blast money out. Uh, Cause ultimately that's your and my tax dollars that are gonna be in spent in Washington DC. You know, I wanna make sure that every kid has food on the plate but in order for that to be successful, we've also got to make sure that farmers are able to actually produce the food they need. Food doesn't just show up at a Walmart or at a school lunch cafeteria. It's got to be grown by somebody probably out here at the fair today that's put the long-term work in. Look, we're a sixth generation farm family. I recognize fully whether it's row crop or whether it's something being laid in a hen house or something that's being um, grazed in a field, we need to make sure that we have real solutions here. It's another reason that I push back so hard on pouring millions of dollars into expeditionary things like lab-grown meats, things that are costing all taxpayers more, but have returned very little results and clearly are undermining a marketplace, which has been good for cattlemen and ho uh, hog farmers across the area. So we, we've done and identified things in the farm bill that are gonna save taxpayers money, so long as we actually get it across the finish line. I feel very good about both feeding America, but then also helping the growers who are actually providing the food for America. Of course, no. The farm bill is not the only thing agricultural related yeah. that you are walking, <laughs> watching. And of course, you know, up trying to go and get that second term now. I mean, what kind of things are you campaigning on to think about? Yeah. The things that are going to concern you now the next two years outside of a farm bill. Yeah. Well, I think definitely uh, an American first agenda is important for this. What we have seen before is we want to make sure that our soybean producers, our corn growers, you know, our cattlemen uh, and our hogs are able to be exported to foreign markets in a fair way where they're not actually making it harder for Americans to be able to sell our products uh, overseas. The other aspect of this is we've got a lot of good conservation programs being led by farmers. I want the USDA and EPA to come out here and see how we do this in Iowa, because this is the next generation of good farm families. They're doing it the right way. Uh, you know, I go out to all 21 counties and I have farm listening tours in every single county. One of the biggest things I hear about is the average age of family farmers 67 years old. God bless, we don't ask any other generation of America to have to do that. The other aspect of this is we also wanna make sure that the next generation of farm families have an on-ramp to this. So whether it's a young farmer, it's a generational farmer, it's a military veteran, they have the opportunity to come out and take over that farm. We're assuming gonna be at a spot where the average farm uh, family is gonna have a head of household who's 73. That is a lot to ask of anybody to continue to farm and feed the world. We can do that right here in America with a strategy of new and beginning farmers having a good on-ramp to be able to do that. Another thing I know we talk about a lot right now is sustainable aviation fuel. The rules yeah. that are involved with it, also the tax credits that will come with conservation practices, which we're waiting for 45Z rulings to come out. Yep. But also the fact that the, the fuels that are becoming part of this are ethanol imports from Brazil, are talking used cooking grease from China and other right. places. Where do we go, and great that we can use some of that stuff to be sustainable and reuse it so it's not being wasted, but the same token, how do we get our seat at the table? Yeah. Because we're producing it right here, what do we have to do also to get that infrastructure up so we're capturing the carbon like we're supposed to so we can qualify for these programs? How do we do yeah. it? Because it's more than just what's happening in the field. Well, and you gotta look at what's happening around the world right now. One of my biggest frustrations is it's cheaper for a you know renewable fuels plant in Georgia to buy corn from Brazil than it is to be able to buy a corn a product here in Iowa and ship it over. We have reverse incentives. We've made it easier for a country like Brazil to claim a carbon crap or a green credit for this than we have for our own farmers who are doing this the right way. So part of it's just rolling back the regulation in Washington, mm -hmm. giving it back to the true guarantee and conservators of the land, our family farms and producers. We see things can happen much better in that aspect. The other part I wanna do is, I wanna to continue to work across the aisle here. Um, you know, it's not just Iowa farmers, it's pork producers in North Carolina. We have similar goals, and we're seeing this on both Democrat and Republican areas. Uh, Nikki Bazinski, my friend from Illinois, she has the number one uh, soybean producing 
district in the country. We're right up there with her being from Iowa, but she's a Democrat. We are mutually aligned in success for this. So there's good bipartisan solutions out there. I guess the big aspect I see coming up here is what we can do collectively to make sure that the USDA and those folks in Washington are really hearing from districts as diverse as North Carolina, Illinois, Iowa, California, uh, Florida, and really using their best practices as a model rather than trying to gin up something that they hear um, largely on a political basis or largely because they think that they can do it uh, to force um, U.S. farmers to have to compete with a foreign competitor who's doing this at a cheaper, worse, more economically and environmentally, frankly, disastrous policy than what we could do right here in the U.S. Well, obviously the Ag, Depart Ag uh, Committee is usually the most bipartisan, even yeah. with what we see right now and how things are, it can be in D.C. Uh, you know, how do we get that to stretch beyond those committees? Obviously, we you know we got to get yeah. right to the table to negotiate, but the Ag you know, communities only make up, what, 10 percent of what the, of the right. whole Congress. So how do we get that voice out to let these people know that this is important, that it's not just yeah. the food in the farm bill, or it's not just the re renewable resources that are in a sustainable Asian fuel. We've got to make it good for everybody. And how do you get that across to someone who lives in the coast area, right. coastal areas that That's doesn't right. understand it? Well, hey, look, I think first and foremost, we need to see food security is really America's national security. I've done 20 years with the U.S. Air Force on multiple combat tours. You know, one's overseas helping other people with their energy independence, but we are growing the food that's sustaining this country as well as fueling this country's future. We gotta make sure that folks, even if you don't have an ag background, recognize how important a place like Iowa, Illinois, Nebraska, Kansas, all these places are mm -hmm. to agriculture. And it goes beyond there. I mean, the number one ag producing state is California. California should have a much bigger buy-in to this being successful. So here's a couple of things I'm recommending. One, these are bipartisan. We're able to get folks on both sides of the aisle to come together on it. We also need folks in the Senate to recognize this isn't something you can simply kick down the road uh, year after year. We're gonna get to a real pinch here. We've had horrible storms here in Iowa. I've been out trying to help our farmers get back on their feet, but we need to make sure the rest of the country realizes that uh, if we can't produce something here domestically, we're gonna be very dependent on a foreign power providing that. Whether that's fertilizer coming from Eastern Europe, whether it's oil coming from the mid Middle East, whether it's food that we have to buy, again, from a place like Brazil, when we have the ability to produce it here domestically. And when you lose a generation of farm families, now all of a sudden you've really hollowed out what makes America autonomously secure. And so we gotta make sure that we're prioritizing that as much as we do our national defense, as much as we do our spending drawdown and our tax cuts, is we've gotta be able to take care of locally grown energy, locally grown food, and that means anything that happens here in the domestic board. It's one of the reasons that I stood up to even Republican leadership when they tried to cut promised agreements on things like biofuel and tax credits that were gonna to go to uh, sustainable aviation uh, fuel and our other areas. It was the Iowa delegation who led the charge. It was the Iowa delegation that frankly won and made sure Congress was being attentive to the fact that we're, while we may be a small portion of the population, we have an outsized role in the entire world economy. Again, was Iowa 3rd District Congressman Zach Nunn. And that brings us to the end of today's show. You can find all our content online at iowaagnet.com. You can follow us on Facebook, X, LinkedIn, and on our YouTube channel. Don't forget about our free three times a day market podcast with analysis sent free of charge to your mobile device through Amazon, Apple, Spotify, Google, and Podbean. From the IARN studios in Des Moines, I'm Dustin Huffman. For Andy Peterson, Riley Smith, and Mark Magnuson, we thank you for watching. This has been Ag Matters PM.